Good afternoon, everybody. This is Michael Munson uh, with Forge. And we're really happy to have you all here today to talk about understanding stocking dynamics and the implications for transgender individuals and communities. We have a guest speaker again this month, which we're really excited about. So we have Rebecca Drakey from the Stocking Resource Center. Um, we always have 90 minutes of really full uh, compact information, and we have that again for you today. So we're pleased that you're here to um, experience that and interact with us around stocking in the trans community. We do try to balance the needs of like one-on-one -on -one material and more complicated material, and today's going to be kind of a mix of both of those two things. So the stocking material that's going to be presented is, is more one-on-one -on -one around stocking, and then we'll have some components that are around uh, how that intersects with transgender people and communities, which will be a little bit more of a 201 kind of discussion. We encourage you, if you would like to have more Transgender 101 basic information, to look at our website and watch one of the pre-recorded Transgender 101 webinars. So a couple pieces of housekeeping. Um, before we get started is, you know, one of the things that we oftentimes forget about is to take care of ourselves when we work in anti-violence fields. So I encourage all of you, if you need to step away from your computer or do whatever it is to take care of yourself uh, during these 90 minutes and obviously throughout the rest of your, your work life. We will be sending out PowerPoints. Um, the PowerPoint that you'll see today will come out tomorrow in an automated email. The recording of today's webinar will be available tomorrow as well. So that link will be in the email that you'll receive tomorrow midday. We're going to ask you to interact with us in a little bit of a, a way a couple times today. And one of them will be through um, the question box. So you can ask questions at, at any point throughout the, the webinar. We'll probably address most of them at the end. But if you have a technical question, um, Larry Cook Daniels, who is the other Forge staff on today's call, will be addressing some of those questions as we move through. So it should be also collecting the questions for our Q&A time at the end. So if everybody can find their question box, um, would people be willing to put in the pronoun that they use in that question box just to make sure that we all can find it? Excellent. So I'm seeing some people type in their pronouns. And that's an unusual question that a lot of times people don't get asked. So um, thanks for, for finding the question box and to, to stick in your, your pronoun. Perfect. Thank you. So the second way that we're going to have you interacting with us is we've got two polls. And the polls are pretty uh, obvious as to how to contribute. We'll have a question with uh, three choices. And you'll get to pick which choice you think is the correct one. And then we'll talk about those answers. And we wanted to also start with just offering you a little bit of an overview of what we can offer you as service providers. We are um, a national uh, training and technical assistance provider through the Office on Violence Against Women. And in that capacity, we offer training and technical assistance, which can take a lot of different forms. The most common probably is one-on-one -on -one support. So if you'd like to email us or call us or reach out to us, we are more than happy to try to work through any challenges or questions that you might have in serving transgender uh, survivors of sexual assault, domestic violence, uh, stalking, or hate violence. We offer monthly webinars, just like this one, uh, different topics every month with a sporadic 101 uh, webinar in there in that mix as well. We do a lot of training across the country, so both at mainstream conferences as well as at um, private or invite events. Um, we're really thrilled to be able to go across the country and actually meet with people face-to-face, -face, since that's um, sometimes a lot of fun and it's different than doing a webinar. And of course, we also have publications that are on our website, some of which are, are text material, like fact sheets or articles, and others are tools which can be really helpful in the work that you do every day. The other kinds of things that we can offer you and your clients are direct support for transgender survivors. And so we encourage you to pass along this information to the trans clients that you're working with um, or have them you know, send them our way. We do offer a 24-7 listserv, which is just sometimes a way that people can connect with other transgender survivors and loved ones you know, in the middle of the night or in the daytime or, or in any way that they need to connect. We also have a fairly large referral database where we try to find providers that will work well with transgender survivors, with trauma, and, and have that be a good match for them so that they're not re-victimized by providers who may not be able to provide the level of care that they need. 
And the last two things that we offer for transgender survivors are um, a Writing to Heal online course, which is available um, anywhere in the country for people because it's all online. And as long as people can access a computer and a phone, they're able to connect to a, a very trauma-informed, really healing environment. And our next course will be starting in June uh, for six weeks, and, and we're really looking forward to that. And the last thing I wanted to share with you is the Espavo project, which is a photographic and narrative project that really encourages survivors to um, be re-empowered and, and take their power back. Most of our webinars have some of those images in them, and I don't think that this webinar does today, but um, feel free to, to look out for those in the future. As I mentioned, we're funded through the Office of Violence Against Women, and we are very grateful for their continued support and helping us make these kind of webinars available to you. Um, so thank you for, for their support. So a little bit about who's who today. Um, again, we're really thrilled to have um, another guest this month. And um, Rebecca and I have worked um, casually together and have known each other for a while. So it's really uh, a pleasure to have her join us in an official capacity um, on today's call. And like I mentioned, Larika Daniels is also here on the call and will mostly be uh, responding to questions in that question box and helping us sort through those things at the end for, for Q&A. So Rebecca is the Deputy Director of the Stalking Resource Center and at the National Center for Victims of, of Crime, uh, housed in Washington, DC. She, she's going to share a little bit more about who she is and who the, what the Stalking Resource Center is in a few minutes. So I want to give you a little bit of an overview of what we're going to do today. Um, in an ideal world, we would be able to pair some of the core information about stocking, so the basics about what stocking is, how prevalent it is, what the key components are, some reasons beyond uh, behind the stock, what stocking is, and uh, how to work best with stocking victims. It would be great to pair that and prevalence rates within the trans community and the trans population and the unique variables specific to trans community members um, and those communities. Unfortunately, we don't have good data on trans communities and stalking. We have some anecdotal stories and information, some of which we'll be sharing today with you. So today, Rebecca's going to share with us some of those core informational pieces around stalking which might not be trans-specific, and I think she's going to add some, some examples in there as well. And I'll interject with some interludes or some small examples at the end of some of her section. And then the last roughly a third of our time together, we'll listen to a recorded uh, case study, and then Rebecca will guide us through some of the common stocking elements that we all listen to um, from that case. So again, we're really glad to have Rebecca with us and partnering with us today. And I'm going to turn over the keyboard, mouse, and um, the floor to her. It's Rebecca. Thanks so much, Michael. Hi, everyone. I'm so happy and honored to participate in this webinar with you all today. Now, I want to extend a huge thanks to Forge for inviting me to be a speaker. I think that uh, Forge's work is incredibly important for our field. And we, as part of the Stocking Resource Center, are proud to partner with them. So I know you can read about me a little bit more on my bio and find out more about my professional background. But just really briefly, um, I've been with the Stocking Resource Center for a little over seven years now. And I have a background in doing direct victim service, uh, direct service work in intimate partner violence, sexual violence, and um, anti and or hate and bias related violence. I also have been a trainer uh, providing public education for a long time on this. And my work really comes from this deep commitment that I have to victims' rights and advocacy. And for me, as a social worker, sort of rooted in a dedication to social justice, for me that means uh, social justice for everyone of all genders and a belief that all of us have a right to live a life free of violence and harm. So one of the things that's been the most interesting for me working for the past seven years at an organization that focuses on the specific subject, on stalking, uh, is just one, how common this form of victimization is and how often it co-occurs with other forms of violence. And really then also how fundamentally misunderstood it is, which is part of what I hope to be able to talk with you all about today. Um, for those of you that aren't familiar with the Stalking Resource Center, we also are funded um, by the the Office on Violence Against Women under the Department of Justice. 
<clears throat> excuse me, and we provide training and technical assistance as well to professionals working to end stalking in their communities. Um, we, our mission is really to enhance the ability of all professionals and organizations and systems to effectively respond to stalking. We envision a future in which the criminal justice system and its many allied community partners can have the best tools to effectively collaborate and respond to stalking. And that's in hopes of improving victim safety and well-being, but also in holding offenders accountable. So when I said that uh, it's interesting for me to work at a national resource center dedicated to ending the crime of stalking, uh, it's because stalking is a very common but unfortunately very misunderstood and often missed crime. Um, it's missed by folks in the criminal and civil justice systems. And, and I would say that it's, it's really misunderstood because if, if you were to do, say, a random survey of 10 different people and ask them to define precisely what stalking is, you'll likely get a bunch of different answers. I mean, you might get some commonalities that people might say, well, it's following, or it's that creepy behavior, or it's, it's all that stuff these kids do these days on the Facebook. But really, the answers are going to vary. And so this is where I want to start our conversation today, with providing you all with a, kind of a working definition of how we can conceptualize and talk about this crime. So we like to, oh, sorry. I'm sorry, Rebecca, this is Laurie. We have had a request for um, you to slow down a little bit. Thank you. I sure, thank you. I sure can do that. Uh, stalking can be defined as a pattern of behavior directed at a specific person that would cause a reasonable person to feel fear. So stalking involves repeated behavior, meaning it needs to happen more than once or twice. Sometimes this can also be called a course of conduct. And this pattern of behavior is fear-inducing behavior. And, and their fears and the behaviors are directed at the victim. And so I want to note that this is not yet a legal definition of stalking, but rather a working definition for us today. And I'm going to refer back to this definition several times as we talk about the different types of behaviors that stalkers engage in. And we're going to talk about what we mean by the specific person and reasonable person. One thing you might notice about this definition is that it does not address the intent of the stalker to cause fear but rather it focuses on the impact of the behavior um, and the effect of that behavior on the victim. Because most stalkers, when asked, or if they were asked, if they intended to cause fear in their victims, they would not admit that. So here's a list of some of the common unwanted behaviors um, that stalkers will use. And sometimes they can just be uh, one of these repeated over and over again, but oftentimes stalkers will use these different tactics. This list is just from one study of, of stalking victimization. And you might notice that these behaviors in and of themselves, for the most part, are not illegal activities. And this can contribute to the difficulty in really identifying and understanding stalking, both for victims and for responders. For instance, you'll see that 36% you know, of victims in this study reported that the stalker spread rumors about them. Well, how can spreading rumors be a crime? I'm going to ask you to think about that, and we're going to, we're going to come back to that. So when you look, though, at these behaviors, it's necessary to view them kind of in a full pattern or a course of conduct to, to help the stalking and understand the stalking and have it become more clear. Because a lot of times, as you can see from this slide, Stalking offenders are using behaviors that kind of fall under the radar. So actions like giving gifts or getting information about the victim from friends or kids or other family members. Sometimes stalking, as I mentioned, also co-occurs with other crimes, or there might be um, criminal acts that make up part of that pattern of behavior directed against that person. So things like vandalism and theft are quite common in stalking cases. And violations for, of orders of protection are also quite common. One other tactic that stalkers will often use is to, to try and get the victim in trouble in some way. Um, this can sometimes be getting them in trouble for something that they may not have ever even done. So for instance, stalking offenders might try and report the police to something for, that the victim didn't do, or use the legal system, the civil system, to introduce you know, frivolous lawsuits. A lot of times, stalkers will also um, kind of leverage what they perceive as a vulnerability on the part of the victim um, in order to get something from them. And I think it's impossible to talk about technology or to talk about stalking today without talking about technology. Um, there are so many different forms of technology 
that stalkers use, and technology is part of almost all stalking cases in some capacity. But I want to say that a lot of times we're asked if technology has created this new type of stalker. And what we always say is that it nece hasn't necessarily caused a new type of stalker, but what technology does is it, it facilitates the stalking. It allows that offender to do what they were going to do, but they can do it a lot more easily. And I think that what's important to know about some of the technologies is that um, stalkers misuse what are otherwise a lot of times valid technologies that are available to all of us. So we have a lot of resources both on our website um, that you can access if you want to learn more about these technologies, how they're used against victims, and how to better document and keep people safe. So one is a DVD and discussion guide that we can send you um, free of charge, and the other is a self-paced online course where you can go through the different technologies and learn more um, about the use of technology to stalk. So I said before that stalking is a pattern of behavior directed against a specific person that would cause a reasonable person to feel fear. So it's easy to understand that there's a specific person, the, the victim, um, but we have to remember that in a lot of stalking cases, other people are victimized by that person's behavior. So that includes friends, family members, um, children, spouses, coworkers, neighbors, anybody close to that victim. And the reasonable person part of the definition gets a little bit more complicated. Essentially, it's a reasonable person could be anyone who might be in a similar circumstance who would be made to feel afraid by the stalker's actions. But this can be difficult to understand because it really requires someone to be able to put themselves in someone else's shoes, so to speak. So to be able to understand from their perspective why this behavior is causing them to feel fear, that requires us, or anyone assisting the victim, to, to see the context and the meaning of the behaviors from that other person's perspective. And you know, we should remember that a lot of times if someone is coming to us and reporting stalking or coming forward because they need help, they're not going to be saying, someone is engaging in a course of conduct directed against me that's causing me to feel fear. And so they're going to be using language, they're going to be saying things like someone's engaging in this creepy behavior or this insulting behavior, someone won't leave me alone. So let's look at a couple of examples of what, what people might say, what stalking might sound like. So a coworker had been harassing me because I'm transgender for the past few months and was fired yesterday and now won't stop calling and hanging up. I'm also getting these weird text messages. Or, my neighbor was super obsessed with me and kept asking me out. I've declined more than several times, and then a few days ago I found this back, back page tranny ad at my home with my home address on it and a whole bunch of nasty sexual Photoshop pictures of me. Or, my ex was served with a protective order this morning and keeps driving by my house, making gestures of a gun shooting me. So in this first situation, you have someone who already has an established pattern of harm against them caused by a coworker. And now the coworker has been fired and can be targeting that victim because they see the victim as responsible for their firing. And the person who had their personal information put up on an online ad and had their image photoshopped, and in this case in a horrifically sex sexual way, this is a case of stalking through online impersonation. So this stalker's actions put this person in obvious danger by putting their personal information up and would cause any reasonable person to be afraid. The, the third example is unfortunately a common one um, that involves presumable previous violence that necessitated the person getting a protective order. And so then the driving by the house is a violation of the protection order, but also that there's an implied threat, like the motion of the gun, implying that this person is coming after them. So oftentimes we need to think through and understand from the context of the behavior, but also the relationship of the offender to the victim so we can better understand why those behaviors are making that person afraid. And a lot of times um, I get the question of what, what makes harassment and stalking different? And I can certainly understand this confusion because a lot of times there are similar behaviors and actions on the part of the offender. So for instance, there could be, a, say, a transphobic neighbor who might be saying insulting and creepy and horrible things to a transgender person. But if the victim, if you will, isn't necessarily made afraid by that perpetrator's actions, but is instead you know, irritated and angry, that might be better classified as harassment, which of course is not to downplay or underestimate the impact of harassment as unfair and as unjust. 
But if the same neighbor engaged in this repeated pattern of behavior, and perhaps even showed some escalation, and those behaviors made that victim afraid, made that person feel afraid for his or her safety, or made them experience um, substantial emotional distress, that might be better defined as stalking. Fear is essentially what really distinguishes harassment from stalking. Or stalking from harassment. So this is Michael again, and I was just going to offer, this is the first of several um, mini little interludes. So I wanted to share a couple of things um, about that kind of distinction between harassment and stalking. We don't have a lot of statistical data, like I mentioned before, to kind of back up the rates of stalking that trans people experience. There was a study done in 2011 uh, called Injustice at Every Turn, and it's a report that details many areas and ways that trans people have experienced harassment. They didn't specifically ask about stalking. What they did find, though, that was that harassment um, is often very present in trans people's lives from really early ages on in school all the way through the lifespan. I encourage you to, to look at that report, Injustice at Every Turn, because it really has a, a a lot of really interesting information, and it's it's very sad information, but it's it's a very useful uh, report. But not looking at that report for a second, and I, I'd like to point out a couple of areas where we hear trans communities talk about stalking behavior. It's important for us to keep in mind that people's experiences are not defined by waiting for the criminal justice system to define if it's stalking or not. Many people in the trans community perceive actions of others as stalking. Um, as a way of empowering people, you know, it's important to validate their experiences and kind of reflect that language back to them. Um, likely, they have experienced repeated intrusive behaviors and are often fearful or anxious about what might happen next or what else might happen. So a couple of examples we commonly see within transgender populations relate to neighbors, public spaces, and sex work. So let's start just for a second with neighbors and acquaintances. A lot of times people report that their neighbors might um, express unusually level, unusual levels of curiosity or might be watching them more closely as they enter and exit their home or apartment. This might start in an innocent way as a neighbor you know, may have thought, hmm, I thought I moved in next to a guy and I'm now seeing somebody walking in and out of that apartment who appears to be female. And so that behavior, obviously, in and of itself is not stalking or, or intrusive, but it might feel a little bit creepy. And that behavior could obviously escalate into being much more in intrusive than curiosity. Another example is when uh, trans people frequent public places. So that could be like going out to a bar or a club, going out to a restaurant, being in social settings or a drugstore or McDonald's or, or any place in public. And what we see a lot of times um, with trans women in particular is that um, they've talked about being followed out of those public spaces when they're leaving to go to their car or public transportation or, or walking home. So this seems to be uh, really prevalent for people who um, others perceive as transgender. So um, other people may see them not as male or female, but may question what gender they are. So that's when that seems to happen the most. The last many example um, about escalated violence and stalking and harassment is within the trans sex work population. There's a disproportionate number of trans people due to economic disparities and employment discrimination who work in street economies in order to survive. This is especially true for uh, trans women of color. Uh, trans sex workers may work in areas that are economically poor, or they may have multiple other trans people who are working in that same geographic area. So a lot of times what happens is they may experience drive-by threats or taunts. They may um, have that, that threat or taunt escalating to overt violence, physical violence, sexual assault, and sometimes even murder. So. This actually, those excellent examples actually lead us <clears throat> to the necessity of talking about fear. Both how victims experience and express fear, but also how we react and how we understand uh, somebody else's expressions of fear. So fear is a very difficult concept um, in regards to a legal issue. So in a lot of ways, it can be very strange to have a crime defined by the emotion of the person who experienced it. So if you think of like other crimes, say arson, for example, or theft, 
if someone were to burn your house down or steal your wallet, you aren't going to be asked by police how you felt about it, and you're not going to be expected to report on your emotions. But with stalking, fear, fear is actually key. Um, and Michael, if you wouldn't mind addressing, uh, furthering the slides, just advancing one. But the challenges are that fear is very subjective. Um, different things make people, uh, different people become fearful from different re for different reasons. Many times, um, especially in our American culture, we don't even admit to being fearful. We value bravery and stoicism and just kind of dealing with whatever's thrown at us. And so, incidentally, a lot of times stalking victims um, who might reach out to someone for help and will explain what's happening will hear things like, well, just ignore it, you know, or rise above it. You're better than that. Like, why are you letting this person get to you? So fear is subjective, and a lot of times people don't admit to feeling fearful, and people might react differently to fear. Some people may become more withdrawn, but I've worked with a lot of victims and survivors who actually experience anger in reaction to their fear. And finally, fear can be difficult to understand because it can be hard to see sometimes why these behaviors are causing someone to be so afraid. Because people will think, well, what's the big deal? This person is only sending you flowers or just texting you a whole bunch of times. So sometimes you have something that might be frightening for the victim but not for you. And so like I said, it, it takes kind of getting in that person's face and understanding from their perspective why it's frightening. Because a lot of time, a lot of times what these offenders are doing are engaging in behaviors that have a really specific meaning that's only understood between that offender and that victim. And when I was doing direct advocacy work, I worked once with a trans woman who had split up from her abusive partner, um, who incidentally became abusive after she told this person that she wanted to, to transition. And so she had moved to another town. She had like been apart from this person for a long time. But a while after she moved and settled in, she started to get this unmarked mail, sort of like with no return address. And what was inside the envelopes were just these pictures of her but before she had transitioned. And then, so she sort of thought that it was creepy and strange, and she figured it was her ex, but didn't really think that much about it, just figured that this person was being a jerk. And, but then she started to get, um, she would come home and find these clothes, her old clothes, kind of strewn across her lawn. And for this victim, then it, it became a threat. It was a threat and it was frightening, in part because it was an obvious message to her that her ex had found her and wasn't going to allow her to live as she needed to. And also, this behavior was really difficult for her to explain to, to people on the outside because, again, people were saying, well, what's the big deal? It's just pictures. It's just clothes. Um, so a lot of times what happens is that victims have to go through extraordinary lengths to explain to us and, and provide us so much information and kind of backstory and context. But the thing about stalking as a crime is that stalking criminalizes what's otherwise non-criminal behavior. So things that in outside, in other contexts would be legal can become criminal inside this concept of a repeated pattern of behavior directed against somebody that's causing them to feel fear. And the fear, of course, can be of, of physical assault, of sexual assault, but also substantial emotional distress, or, you know, or fear for harm to others. Um, sometimes victims of stalking aren't necessarily afraid for their own safety, but are concerned for their safety of their spouses or of their children or of their friends. And a lot of times the fear can also be of, of harms to their reputation or employment or other aspects of their life. So we have to think kind of broadly about what fear is. And I don't think that I could overstate the incredible toll that this crime takes on victims. Stalking victims are, are preyed upon, and this experience adversely affects victims in a lot of different ways. Because stalking is really trauma-inducing. I mean, many of the results here that you see the impact of stalking on victims that you see here are very common responses to traumatic events. So finally, to talk and to really understand stalking, you have to understand the context of the behaviors. Context is really critical in these cases. And it's sort of interesting in a way because it's really a crime that is dependent on putting together a bunch of pieces of a puzzle, right, where you can have seemingly benign and disparate behaviors like phone calls, text messages, letters, emails, but then when it's viewed in context, the pattern or the course of conduct of that offender um, can really display the crime of stalking. Each incident kind of taken in isolation may not show the stalking. It's when it's viewed in its entirety that it becomes this fear-inducing pattern. 
So interlude number two is around fear. And like Rebecca said at the beginning of the segment, fear is really subjective. And oftentimes, it's kind of diff difficult to pinpoint or describe what it is. And people may have fear responses to different things. One of the things I think to keep in mind is that trans community members often live in fear every day, not necessarily about stalking behaviors, but just about surviving in the world. So although the fears that they live with might not be directly related to stalking, uh, fears can be about anticipated actions of others, uh, which might be about overt harassment or maybe less overtly around those microaggressions or those things that happen, those little small things that happen every day. Fears could be around somebody, um, if somebody will make a comment to them on their way to work or if they'll be discriminated against in finding a place to live. Fears can extend to very basic safety about leaving the house or going out in public, kind of like I mentioned before. One of the things that's interesting to, to look at when we talk about trans communities is how tightly knit uh, the community can be and how fast uh, the word can travel about um, what happens to one member of the community. So people hear about which places are safe, and safe is in big quotes there, but people know where where it's kind of safer to hang out. People know which neighborhoods um, people have experienced somebody following them in, um, which people have been known to engage in violent behaviors, or who has experienced different forms of harm or harassment. So those stories can travel really quickly throughout the trans community. And they can carry a lot of weight, because they're oftentimes true. But just hearing those stories can just increase the level of fear that trans people experience and hold kind of in their, their brains every single day. Um, of course, what fear can also do to somebody is to extend to wanting to reach out for help. So a lot of times, trans people will experience crimes, stalking or other crimes, and they won't reach out for, for help from law enforcement or from other direct service providers. That's Rebecca. Actually, let me set up the, the poll. We're going to do a poll next. And let me just set this up for people. So um, on the screen, in just a second, you will see the question of um, how many people do you think were stalked in the last year? And as soon as the screen refreshes, you'll see the choices of 1.2 million, 3.4 million, or 6.6 .6 million. This is Lurie. Let me just clarify that that's people, overall population in the United States. How many were stalked? Thank you. And as people continue to vote, I'll, I'll close this out in just a second and, and show you all the results. OK, so on the slide, in just a second, you'll see Hopefully you will see the results that most of you said, 60% of you said 3.4 million. And Rebecca, do you want to take us through the, the next part then? Sure thing. Um, so I bet people are curious to know what the answer is, actually. And the, the answer is actually that stalking is much more common and prevalent than people might think. Um, it's actually 6.6 .6 million people are stalked in a one-year period. And if I can advance the slides, I could show you um, a little bit about where that data comes from. So the 6.6 .6 million people stalked in a one-year period, this information was given to us from what's termed the NISPIS study, the National Intimate Partner and Sexual Violence Survey. It was the largest study that's ever been done um, really on all these issues, but particular to this topic about stalking. And it showed us that it was 6.6 .6 million people in a one-year period. And when it looked at stalking victimization at some point in a person's lifetime, it was about 1 in 6 women and 1 in 19 men. Now, in a moment, I want to make a comment about the limitations of this study as it relates to gender identity. Um, but first, I want to say that when we look at large statistics like this, like 6.6 .6 million people stalked in a one-year period in the United States, it can be difficult to figure out how to relate that to your own community, kind of because a lot of people want to know, well, what's happening where I am? What's happening where I live? So one way to get the rough statistical estimate of the amount of stalking that's happening in your community is to take the population of your community, divide that result by 1,000, and multiply that number by 26.5, and that equals the statistical equivalent or number of stalking cases in your community each year. 
So obviously, if you're in a community that has 10,000 people, the numbers are going to be much lower. But this can give some kind of rough information. And again, this, um, if folks are, I know it's after lunch for a lot of people, afternoon, no one wants to do math. This will be in your PowerPoint when you get it. Um, so you can learn more about how to get some local estimates of stocking in your community. Now, I, I said that I wanted to make a little note about how this research um, relates to transgender and other uh, gender nonconforming individuals. In the survey instrument of this study, respondents were only given two choices for gender identity, either male or female. Um, and many of us in the field, uh, because we, this research is so necessary and so important to have, um, we've obviously expressed concern about this lack of inclusion or kind of effort to better capture people of different genders. And so the slide that you're seeing here is the answer from CDC who conducted the study. Um, on their website, on their report, you can read more about that there. But the other thing to consider is that sometimes what happens in these research studies is that transgender individuals and individuals who identify themselves as not as male or not as female might be discounted but also kind of shuffled into the results because they're in a lot of ways compelled to either answer male or female. So a lot of times when presented with only two choices, respondents are, are kind of asked to choose the option that best represents how they might closest identify. So unfortunately for a lot of trans individuals, their experiences might not be specifically included, but are sometimes kind of already um, in the results, but difficult to sort of capture in a more specific way. So our hope for future research is that uh, transgender people's experiences can be better captured and documented, especially because we know, and, has, and as Michael has said, trans people experience high rates of victimization and co-occurring crimes. So I will say the um, importance of this study, though, showed us that one, that, it, that stalking is a very prevalent and widespread problem, but also it captured and reconfirmed what other studies have shown us about stalking, namely that uh, people who are younger experience higher rates of stalking. And contrary to what is sort of popular ideas of stalking, most victims know their offender in some capacity. We still have this sort of notion in our society that stalkers are all kind of the quote unquote peeping toms, the people who are just kind of the creepy ones hanging out in the trees with binoculars by your house. But a lot of times offenders and victims are known to each other, oftentimes in a formerly or currently intimate capacity. And what we know about intimate partner stalkers or former intimate partners is that, that those folks pose a greater risk. They pose a greater risk to their victim and they're more likely to physically approach that person to be insulting and interfering on multiple levels of that person's lives. They're, um, they're more likely to use weapons and their behaviors can escalate, escalate kind of quickly. And the reoffense rates are very high. You know, it's unfortunate because I think as a society when there's a pre-existing relationship between the offender and the victim, we tend to minimize the risk that that victim faces or the seriousness of the offense. But what we've actually seen is that intimate partner stalkers can be and pose a greater risk to their victims. And it, intuitively, it sort of makes sense because if you think about you know, stalking being really dependent on fear, who knows your fears better and, and how to get to you and knows your pattern better than somebody than with whom you've been in a relationship. So interlude number three is around prevalence, um, more specific to trans people. And you know, I know I said at the beginning that we don't really have stocking data uh, around trans people, but we have a little teeny bit, and this is a little teeny bit that we have. So Rebecca kind of shared the, well, she didn't kind of share, she shared the, the truer prevalence data. And we wanted to share with you results from our 2011 survey of trans folks on their attitudes and knowledge related to accessing victim services. We had 1,005 valid responses. And as part of the demographic data that we collected, we asked people to um, simply do a checkoff box of indicating which of the uh, following that they'd experienced, if they'd experienced childhood sexual abuse, adult sexual assault, dating violence, intimate partner violence, stalking, or hate-motivated violence. So the graph on your screen right now shows that 16% of those who had experienced stalking had experienced none of the other crimes listed. When we look at how many people had experienced more than one type of violence or abuse, you can see that 84% of people who experienced stalking also experienced one or more of the other types of, abuse, of, of abusive behaviors. So even though this doesn't tell us the prevalence of stalking within the trans community, 
it does indicate that stalking for trans people is often accompanied by other forms of abuse or that the trans person has experienced other types of victimization at other points in their life. You know, and I think that this is, this is a really important thing to include because we know that a lot of times people who are experiencing stalking are experiencing other forms of, of violence, of harm that comes to them. And, and I think sometimes we tend to look at these issues in isolation rather than looking at all aspects of how someone is being harmed and the effects that those harms are having on someone. So I want to take a brief moment to talk about um, stalking offenders. And in order to do that, um, I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about kind of the research on stalkers. There's, there's some really informa in interesting information out there, and you can link to some of that from our website. Um, what a lot of the researchers will do is refer to different stalking typologies. And while some of that research is really interesting, we found that the typologies or profiles can be somewhat limiting, and not all the researchers agree on the different types and the different profiles. What we have found to be a little bit more helpful is to talk about some of the common characteristics of stalking offenders. And Michael, if you could advance the slides, um, let me do that. I can move through some of that. So a few of the things that you see here are common offender characteristics, and I just want to touch on a few of them. Um, probably it makes sense to folks that stalking perpetrators often display a high level of jealousy and possessiveness, um, can be incredibly manipulative, not just, and not just of the victim, but of other people, especially in attempts to get information or to get access to the victim. Um, stalkers ignore boundaries. They ignore boundaries that are set by the victim. They ignore boundaries that might be set by police. They ignore boundaries set by court orders. And they have, a lot of times, this incredible sense of entitlement. Um, they're entitled to do what they're doing. And this, this entitlement is common, obviously, in intimate partner stalking cases. But I think it's also important to reflect on the sense of entitlement in relation to the bias-motivated stalking that we know that some trans people experience. And sometimes stalking offenders believe that they're, quote unquote, entitled to know the, quote unquote, again, true gender of, of a trans person. And they're determined to expose them or out them and to do these things that, that um, don't allow them to live their lives as, as the way that they need to. And so a lot of these offender characteristics can be really common. And it kind of begs the question as to well, why do they stalk? Why do stalkers do what they do? And it's hard to answer that because it's hard to guess sometimes at the motivation of a particular, um, of, at all offenders. And I think there's a lag on advancing the slide or I'm not able to. But. It should be the common offender characteristic that's up right now. Would you like another yep. slide up? Yep, if you can just go to that next slide. I'm not able to advance them for some reason. So. Okay. Um, in our experience, stalkers are sometimes motivated and fueled by the sense of rejection, whether after a breakup or even just some denial of interest on the part of the victim, but also obsession. Um, obsession is a really common one, and again, I've worked with different transgender survivors of stalking who have been stalked and will report that and recount these sort of experiences where someone became over obsessed with them and overly nosy and invasive and, and engaging in these types of behaviors against them. And a lot of times stalkers want to have this power and control. And bias motivation is, is another common one. Sometimes stalkers will also stalk in the premeditation or the planning to commit a crime, uh, for instance, before a sexual assault. And finally, we see that stalkers stalk because they can. They do it because they get away with it. And largely, as a society, we don't take the issue seriously. So the fourth interlude um, is about offenders. And um, I wanted to share a little story that um, many may not initially perceive as stalking, but it does fit the legal definitions of stalking in the state of Maine, where this family lives. Um, we're sharing it because it illustrates that stalking can extend to any age and take on um, some possibly unusual forms, or at least things that we don't think about often. So the photo on the screen is Nicole Maines with her father and her brother. Nicole was assigned male at birth, but by the fourth grade she was presenting as a girl all the time at school and all the time at home. And school staff and officials and her family recognized that it was really important uh, to Nicole's emotional and psychological health that she be one of the girls at school, and that included using the communal girls' bathroom um, by the time she entered fifth grade in the next year. 
what ended up happening was that a grandfather and a legal guardian of another student encouraged and probably outright instructed his grandson to call Nicole homophobic and transphobic names and to do things like follow her into the bathroom on multiple occasions, so follow her into the girls' bathroom. The grandson was suspended for misbehavior, and the grandfather filed a complaint in 2008 with the Maine Human Rights Commission. He claimed that his grandson's right related to public accommodation had been violated. The grandson's behavior and the grandfather's complaint resulted in Nicole being required to use a staff single-stall bathroom away from the other girls and really kind of ostracized her from, from the other girls. So Nicole's family, in response, filed a complaint with the Maine Human Rights Commission. And fortunately, this is a really positive story that has a, a good ending in that after a long legal battle, Nicole's family finally won, and Nicole was able to resume interacting at school with the rest of the girls. So I want to just talk a little bit about about what we call the social normalization of stalking. Um, when I said before that stalkers stalk because they can, part of what I think fuels some of that is that we have made stalking somewhat normal in our culture. We joke about it, we don't take it seriously, and oftentimes we actually confuse it with romance. It's, it's even in the language that we use. I'm, I'm willing to wager that at some point you've probably heard the term stalking used in a different manner than how we're discussing it here today. You might have heard, or maybe you've even said, oh, I'm totally stalking that person on Facebook, or, oh my gosh, that person is, is stalking me. You know, you might see someone at the store, a few minutes later you see them at a coffee shop, and then maybe later in the day you see them at a restaurant and you joke, are you stalking me? I mean, that's a very common way that we hear that term used. And some of this can be fueled by our popular culture and just the way that the word has become somewhat divorced from its meaning. Oftentimes what we'll see in movies or hear in music is this confusion of stalking with love and affection and romance. You know, and it's sort of a very popular conceit in, in a lot of TV shows, movies, um, that persistence is the key to winning the object of your affection, right? So the message is kind of pursue, pursue, pursue until someone gives in and don't take no for an answer. And a lot of times what accompanies that message is that a stalker is just this kind and decent person who's really just misunderstood, whose actions and intentions aren't malicious. You know, and we see this in, in kind of a a silly way sometimes in different music or movies. Um, I'm guessing some of you can think about you know songs or movies that, that you've seen or listened to, um, but one of the classic stalking songs that I always think of is The Police, Every Breath You Take, um, Every Movie You Make, I'll Be Watching You. I will save you the horror of having me sing this to you, but I'm sure most of you can think of this song. And it's actually kind of a classic stalking song. Um, the lead singer of Police in an interview years ago said, I never understood why this is thought of as a romantic song, because I wrote this song about a crazy pathological stalker. You know, and there's lots of different examples of that, and, and again, I challenge you in, uh, just kind of when you have some free time to go and look up different stalking songs, or songs that you might have thought were romantic um, might have that kind of element in there. Another way that we see this sort of confusion is in sometimes with our romantic cards that we send each other. This uh, picture that you're seeing is a Valentine's Day card that was sold for a while at Target, and it says, stalker is a harsh word, I prefer Valentine. You know, and it was, you know, a lot of people were outraged by this, and the store eventually took it down, but, you know, we don't do this, we don't have these types of cards at mainstream stores, at least, for, um, with other forms of interpersonal violence. Like, imagine if the card said something like, rapist is such a harsh word, I prefer Don Juan, or, you know, a restraining order is just another way of saying I love you. Like, that's, that's not what we do, but we do joke about this with stalking. And there's this conflation, oftentimes, with romance. This t-shirt that you're going to be seeing says, some call it stalking, I call it love. This was sold at a junior section at a department store. And you know, the stalking is written in all pink, glittery font. And I encourage you, again, to look up things like stalking t-shirts and stalking jokes, and you'll see many more examples of this. And, of course, with technology and how a lot of us interact with technology, this is further confused how we understand stalking. Um, we are invited to share incredible details about our lives and to look into and appear into incredible amounts of information about other people's lives through these mediums. These mediums can be incredibly great for community building, 
Um, but what's unfortunate is that when we infuse the word stalking into the mix, it implies that we're doing something wrong or taboo. And so then, therefore, it's sort of attractive. But this further complicates it for people who actually are being stalked online, who are being impersonated, who are being harmed. So not that I think that necessarily popular culture causes stalking. I think sometimes just the language that we use and the way that sometimes we joke about it makes it pretty confusing. And I'm going to go through a couple of these things kind of fast just for the sake of time, but I do want folks to know that stalking is a crime in all 50 states, the District of Columbia, all of the United States territories. The Uniform Code of Military Justice that covers all branches of the military um, prohibits stalking, and several Native American uh, tribes in their tribal codes have uh, anti-stalking provisions. So this is a crime everywhere that you go, and there are a couple of federal statutes that deal with stalking and cyber stalking. But in terms of kind of history of it, it's a, it's a relatively young crime. The first stalking law wasn't passed until 1990 in California. So I encourage you to learn more about the stalking laws in your state and the other applicable laws. So, and you can learn more about the crime classifications. And then also, some states have civil remedies in addition to criminal laws in, in your states. So let's talk about working a little bit with, about, with stalking victims. We would like to identify and sort of organize several aspects of need and possible service delivery for stalking victims. And kind of our easy way to, to kind of organize this is to look at the safety needs, documentation, advocacy, and support needs to victims. Now there's a lot more information on our website, and we could spend just an entire webinar talking about um, how to meet the needs of stalking victims and survivors. But I want to just touch on a few kind of quickly. When we're looking at safety, it's really important to look at the threat of imminent harm or danger to the victim or someone close to that victim. Um, part of what's helpful in working with stalking victims is to provide a bit of education about stalking to the victim and to also understand some of the common responses that victims have and how they might sometimes actually be engaging with their offender. It's important to understand that oftentimes victims will engage with their offender in attempts to keep themselves safe. And so you might have victims that kind of negotiate with their stalker or sometimes do things that might not make sense on the outside, but they're doing things to minimize the threat that's coming to them. So for instance, um, a victim might you know, actually talk to their stalker on the phone because they've learned that if they just keep that person on the phone, then that person won't show up at their house. One of the things that it's, um, can be helpful to recommend to victims is to try to completely disengage to the extent possible from that stalker. To disengage with that person and to have no contact because it's important to remember that a stalker wants that contact with that victim. They want access and they want to be in charge. So if, if I'm a stalker and I call somebody 19, or the, yeah, 19 times and they don't pick up but they finally answer on the 20th time, I just learned that all I need to do is call them 20 times the next time and I'll get to them. But again, we know that sometimes it can be impossible for that person to completely disengage from that stalker. So we have to generate some safety plans that really address that victim's life situation, the risks that the stalker is, is presenting to them, and other systemic barriers. Um, so that if they're unable to access you know, mainstream services, what other, what other services can we recommend? Um, how can we work to keep that victim safe? Um, what are our levels of confidentiality that we can offer? And how comfortable are we in talking about technology and the use of technology? Um, a lot of victims have been labeled as paranoid or overreacting, especially when the stalking is hard to prove, like in the case of technology. And as I said, you know, some transgender victims might not be comfortable accessing sort of traditional types of services or reporting a crime because they're uncertain of how they'll be treated um, in sharing certain information. So stalking victims um, can, re can feel extremely isolated, it's sort of like a prisoner in their own home, and we want to figure out the best way to work with them to balance their safety and their freedom. And the unfortunate and unfair reality for a lot of stalking victims is that they do have to change their routines and adjust their um, sort of their life to the stalker's actions. And every time I'm working with someone, and you know, I, I explain to them how completely unfair it is. And you'll see a lot of people that will be dropping out of school or stop going to certain bars or clubs to avoid that interaction. But for each, there's no one kind of um, blanket approach that we could offer. Each 
plan has to be individualized and respond to the specific needs of that specific person. One thing that we do encourage victims to do is to enlist support and assistance from family and friends and coworkers. I mean, this sort of allows that support system to shoulder part of the burden. So some of that can be to get over the hurdle of talking about some of the, um, the shame that, that stalking victims might feel, because you really do need community to help keep people safe. Another thing that can be really essential is documentation. I don't think I could overemphasize the importance of documentation in stalking cases. Uh, trauma, as I mentioned, affects a victim's memory, and victims might forget events quickly or get them confused, um, not really sure about what order they happen in. So we recommend that stalking victims keep a log, kind of keep a diary of, a stalk, of the different stalking incidents that make up that pattern of behavior. The log allows them to kind of write down each stalking behavior with information about the event so she already has a written record of the behaviors to show, maybe to show law enforcement if they decide to report the case. Um, but I have to say, documenting stalking behavior also functions as a sort of empowerment tool for victims. The act sometimes of documenting what's happening can be a way for a person to kind of look at this confusing constellation of events and make some sense out of it. And it can help reduce some of the um, minimization that might be happening. If they might be hearing from someone, well, what's the big deal? It's just text messages. Or, you know, but when you have pages and pages and pages of these harassing messages, it, that might combat some of that, that minimization. I imagine that a lot of folks are familiar with kind of the fundamentals of advocacy. And I just want to say briefly that advocacy can include allowing someone to tell their story and their experience from their perspective. And sometimes in just the telling of that story, survivors can transition some of that traumatic experience into and memory into everyday memory. And we can provide helpful feedback in kind of however we come in as friends, as service providers, um, and validate that what's happening to them is in fact frightening, is a crime, and is unfair, and that their responses to what is happening are normal and valid. And part of advocacy and support can be about education and trying to assist that victim in what might be happening next. And you know, stalkers take away a victim's ability to kind of be able to guess more or less at what's happening next. And you know, this might not seem like that big a deal. You might say, well, no one really has the ability to predict what's going to happen. But I want to challenge you on that and think about your own day so far and how much of it you probably were pretty much able to plan more or less at what was going to happen. You know, like so for me this morning, I woke up, I drank some coffee, I checked my email, I made breakfast. And never during any of those activities was I too worried that someone was watching me or going to break into my email or call me and give me a bunch of harassing messages. You know, and I went out to the store and I didn't worry that someone was following me in my car. I went to work and I pretty much was able to do what I needed to do uninterrupted, you know, didn't have someone calling me and harassing me. But that's not the reality for stalking victims. They don't know what's going to happen next and where that offender is going to pop up. So victims need information and the ability to take some of that self-determination back. And so part of, of that is working with them to figure out how to cope on a daily basis and how to kind of be prepared emotionally for what's happening. And some of that is just about how um, to, if they decide to engage with the criminal or civil justice process, what that process might look like. So it's now time for you guys to um, get ready with your, your mouse to click on another poll answer. So the second poll is, uh, what percentage of stalking victims report to law enforcement? So the choices that you have are 27 to 30%, 37 to 40%, 47 to 50%. Hopefully that's popping up on most of your screens. And the results will hopefully All right. So it looks like about ninety three percent of people are saying twenty seven to thirty percent. Okay. Uh, well, so the answer is actually, the answer is just under 40%, so about 37 to 40% of victims report to law enforcement. 
And the reasons for not reporting are, are varied, but most commonly people aren't reporting because they're kind of minimizing what's happening or believing that it's a private personal matter only related to them. And when I say minimizing, this is not blaming the victim. I have found that a lot of victims and survivors take in all these same messages that, that we've been talking about and then have sort of translated that into that no one's going to believe them or it's not that big a deal and they should just get over it. And so a lot of people are not reporting for the reasons that you see here. And the reality is that for a lot of victims, when and if they finally do report to the police, um, they're reporting because they're kind of at the end of their rope. Whatever they have been doing to stop and to mitigate what's been happening hasn't worked. So they need outside support. So when safety planning is done, and is done with an advocate, with a service provider, with a friend, um, with a victim of stalking, each safety planning, each safety plan needs to be specific to the victim's need and should include specific strategies to help that person based on whatever their needs are. And those strategies need to be specific. And sometimes we need to be able to rely on informal networks or non-traditional supports. So I would encourage folks um, who are service providers after this webinar to maybe facilitate a follow-up discussion on what additional barriers and systemic barriers can be present for, um, at, for transgender victims who might want to access services. Uh, in our experience, these include you know, lack of specific services for trans victims, lack of specific services uh, for folks that know about stalking, um, rigid gender attitudes and stereotypes that could cause a trans victim um, and those around them to possibly minimize the seriousness of the behavior, an unwillingness uh, sometimes for people to acknowledge that a behavior could be causing someone to feel fear, and then, of course, the real and justified concern that law enforcement won't take trans people's reports of stalking seriously. Um, so I'm going to skip this interlude for the sake of time, and I will post it on uh, the follow-up email that you all receive tomorrow so that you can get that. Um, Rebecca, did you want to say anything more about the Stalking Resource Center before we move on to the case example? No, nope, I think that's great. Thank you. Okay. Perfect. Um, and before we, Lori's going to introduce the case example. I, I, want, I know that we're running a little bit behind what the time we had hoped to be at. So if we don't have enough time for questions, we, we'll try to have some time for questions. Please feel free to keep on writing your questions in the question box, and we will sort them and, and get them to Rebecca if um, she's the appropriate person to answer, and we will send them back out to you all. So Lori, can you introduce our case example? Yes. To illustrate some of the nuances and complexities of stalking cases, we asked Tristan, a college professor who is also black and transgender, to recount his experiences of being stalked for over a year by a female student on his campus. This interview was completely unscripted and comes across as raw, emotional, and even abrasive in parts as Tristan relives this very painful and confusing experience. Since Tristan is both transgender and a gender studies specialist, his description of what happened also includes a heavy emphasis on his perceptions of the gender dynamics of his experience and how his colleagues and supervisors responded when he sought help. Okay, um, this story there you go right off the bat. Um, the, the story is um, of experience of mine that I, I had as an untenured university professor. In fact, I was going through tenure this year. This was the year of my tenure review. This is about three years ago. And uh, I had a student who I had mentored for about a couple of years, and we had grown to have a good mentoring relationship. And uh, about uh, the early part of that year, during the beginning of the, the academic year in September, she Came, came on to me basically in, um, in I think I can't remember the email or it was a text, but basically she made advances to me and told me that she had romantic feelings toward me. And uh, I was surprised and shocked at the time, but uh, at the, certainly what I did was to put up the barriers. Uh, I've never had a student, you know, just don't do that kind of thing. I'm very clear about institutional boundaries and ethics. And so I explained to the student that this was inappropriate and that uh, this was 
uh, it was not possible for she and I to be together. And at that time, what I was trying to do was save the mentoring relationship. And I thought if I just put up my put up the barriers, a student would then hear that and re re sort of go back, or, or at least not not do those things anymore. But it turns out she did not take no for an answer, and it uh, she went on to get my uh, telephone number and continued to text me, and I would tell her this is inappropriate. Uh, she would send me emails, and and at some point, um, fairly early on, when I realized the student was not going to going to heed my my warning, I went to my supervisor because I didn't at that point I didn't know how to handle the situation <clears throat> of being dealing with a student coming on to me, and I had transitioned at that point. I was in a, I had transitioned to male, so I went to my supervisor who was also female and. Um, at, and, and a feminist, and um, unfortunately, I didn't get support from her. In fact, she laughed it off as just kind of a silly schoolgirl crush. And uh, I was somewhat surprised at this because she's a female, like I said, and a feminist, and I would have expected a different response from that. So then I went to another female professor. I, I, I was going to female uh, colleagues because that's my training, I guess, or that's my socialization, is to go, because, yes, to go and confide in a woman, uh, having been part of women's communities a lot. So I went to another female prof uh, professor, colleague, and um, she also kind of grinned and laughed it off. And so at some point, I was sort of dealing with this on my own, and I realized I didn't have to get a lot of help to deal with this. <laughs> so let me see, I'm trying to go back. The student got my continue to text me, continue to email, and I was also under a lot of stress at this time. So remember, I'm going through tenure, and in my department, uh, I was getting a lot of pushback and a lot of resistance about my tenure because I had gone to the dean and, and said some other things about the department, and then it got back, and so they, they were just really trying to railroad me on my tenure. So I was very afraid also. I felt like I was caught in a, in a catch-22 site situation where I was trying to get help from people, someone, uh, to help me deal with this situation, which I clearly had no roadmap for in a male body dealing with female co-eds. But I also didn't want it to blow up in my face and for it to come back to haunt me because, I, again, I'm black, I'm transsexual, I'm male, and uh, I could just see the media having a field day with something like this. Um, and in my case, I didn't think uh, that the, 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 anyone would believe me because uh, the way I had been taught to read the situation is that, that male professors are prey on young female professors, and, and no one had ever sort of talked about or discussed the ways in, in my community, my women's communities, the ways that uh, female co-eds can, can also sexually harass professors. And so uh, because I had a sort of a feminist understanding of sexual harassment, I wasn't able to really name my own oppression or name what the power uh, imbalance was. And so I kept thinking I could have control of the situation. I could make the suit stop. And I certainly felt that at some point I had to do that because I wasn't going to get any help from my colleagues. Now, it wasn't until I finally went to my male colleagues that I someone talked. You know, the guys, they heard me. They listened to me. They actually told me stories that they themselves had been through similar incidents, and I had had no idea. So this was a very eye-opening experience for me. And um, But all this time, and they, and they also gave me some advice about how to deal with it. But this went on for the better part of a year, dealing with this student through texts, uh, emails. And sometimes the student, when she wouldn't get the kind of response from me that she wanted, she wanted me to basically return her, her amorous intentions. And when she wouldn't get that response, she would send me some really ugly emails just really blasting me as a professor and a person. And uh, it, they were abusive. That was what they were, plain and simple, they were abusive. And uh, I was very afraid, though, at that point, if anyone um, had found out or if this got really ugly, that the situation could be turned against me. So that, in other words, the student, it was because it was just my word against the student. And there were these texts going back and forth. But I think we both, or all three of us, know that in any court of law, uh, discourse can be turned on its head or anywhere. It doesn't have to be in a court of law. It can be in a classroom. You could turn things and invert things in ways that you want to uh, to fit your own interests. So my concern at this point was 
how not to let it blow up in my face and cost me my tenure within the context of a department that was already also doing violence to me at the same time, psychologically and emotionally. So this was a very, very trying year for me. And uh, the student would send these you know, very irascible, sometimes petulant, tempestuous emails um, that really terrified me. At, at some point, I came to realize, too, that the student was stalking me. And, um, and this is why I say that, because she would show up in places where I normally would go, but she normally wouldn't go in those places. So I kept sort of seeing her visible in lots of places. Or she would come to my office very late at night, and I'd ask, you know, tell students don't do that. Um, but she would come, and um, she had a way of uh, always wanting to touch me, which felt really kind of weird, uh, and at some point felt kind of icky, and I realized she was stalking me. But I think um, what I came to understand, too, about the, the stalking piece is it's, it's like you internalize this sort of panoptic surveillance where, or I had done so anyway, and so I came to never feel safe anywhere, not even in my own home. And I changed my phone twice. Um, phone number twice. The student somehow she managed to get the phone number anyway, and uh, I told my my wife about these things. Who that was the other thing I was concerned about uh, whether what this would kind of kind of what kind of problems it might create between me and my wife. But my wife was very supportive of me at the time, so I didn't have to really worry about that. But uh, yeah, the, the 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 psychological part. I I had anxiety for the first time in my life in a very long time ever. I really began to develop anxiety. And I had anxiety about where the student would pop up next, for example. Um, or if I changed, if she tried to friend me on Facebook, or she could say, like I said, she would get my private email, these kinds of things. So I really felt like I didn't, I felt like I was living in a fishbowl, and I didn't have a lot of privacy uh, or security. <clears throat> and the more angry the student would get with me because I wasn't responding to her, then the more fearful I became and to worry because I watch these shows every now and then. I don't let them get the best of me, but <laughs> every now and then I watch them with these creepy shows about some, you know, somebody that's gone off the deep end and done something completely crazy that no one would ever expect. And so I think, well, I don't want to be that victim, you know, of some student just literally going off the deep end. So um, eventually, so this went on for the good course of a year, and it, I became, to, I, I, I began to understand to stay in, be interested also that the university had a, a right, I mean, had an obligation to protect me, but it wasn't doing that. And um, it wasn't until I basically threatened to sue the university, I had to go to the university attorney and take all of the emails and all the texts and basically say, you know, this is this has been happening to me and if, for a good for over a year now, and if you guys don't do anything about it, I'm, I'm going to sue you. And, and of course, they immediately acted and resolved the issue, and I never heard from the student again. But this went on for the better part of a, a year. And I was afraid, I was afraid, you know, for my own safety. I was afraid of my job and what it might happen. I may not get tenure or worse, I could be fired because universities don't like to deal with controversies. Uh, even if the professor, even if I'm, I'm innocent, uh, the university probably would have fired me, or probably would have denied my tenure, so that as a way to make the whole situation go away, so that it doesn't pop up in the media and become uh, become becomes viral, and then um, there's the danger of it smearing the reputation of the university. So the university, in order to sort of to, to cover their asses, so to speak, they just would have they would have denied me my tenure in some sort of way. And because um, if they fired me, you know, there would have been a little bit more controversy. I could have sued back. So my concern was my job. My concern was for my life uh, on some level. And I think at some point, now that I look back, I didn't, didn't really think about it at the time, but I had concern about my own psychological stability just to be able to get through this because it was a really stressful situation. Um, and I think beyond that, if my biggest fear more than anything, looking back, was my reputation. Because if that had turned against me or if it had blown up in my face, there's no way in hell I would have, I would have stood, I would have had anything to stand on. There's no way. Black male trans, transsexual professor, uh, sexual harassed, <laughs> you know, co-ed, 20, 23 year old co-ed female, no, there's no way. So I would have lost, not only lost my job, but I would have lost my reputation as a professor, as a professional, 
and I would have lost my reputation as, as someone who is uh, actively uh, trying to, to combat sexism. I just would have, you know, people would have chalked me up as some sort of, um, you know, some predatory professor who, who preys on young, young female co-eds. So, so those, yeah, those are my biggest concerns. So that's kind of the story in a nutshell, but I can ask, I can answer questions too. So Tristan, thank you for sharing that. It sounds really painful. Um, you said that when you went to the school um, administrators and said, look, I think I've got a lawsuit here if you don't help me, uh, and they decided to help you. You said that whatever they did, um, that she never contacted you again. Is that correct? That's correct. And do you know what they did? Well, I gathered all the information that my male colleagues had told me. My, my male colleagues had told me to gather information. They, in fact, what they said is don't tell anybody anything because no one is going to believe you. And that was a whole other level of education about men and visibility and, um, in terms of sexism against men. But sort of beyond that, it, they, you know, they said just, just, just gather all the evidence you can and then compile it, and then that's when you make your move on the attorney um, when, when, when you've got enough, information, enough evidence, and, and then, <clears throat> then they'll believe you. And, and they did. That's that turns out. So I, I presented it to the attorney through an through internet, took all the Texas. Because the student, it, it, the following year, the students had started up um, sending me emails again. I think there was a, that's the thing about stalking, too. People go away for a while, and then they pop back up so that you, you're never really sure where they're going to be, or even if there's a length of time where you don't see them, you're never really sure if you're out of danger. So that's the part that's the, the anxiety-inducing piece that stalking kind of uh, induces within. So um, the, what the university attorney did, I believe, was take the email, because the student, so the student sent me this email trying to contact me again at the very beginning of the semester the following year, and I just said, that's it done it, I've had it, and I think partly because it was the beginning of a new year, and I said, I am not going to tolerate another year of this. So I took everything I had, attached it to a file, and uh, sent the, and, and forwarded the student's email to the attorney, and said, this person has been causing me problems for an entire year, here's the response of my chair, here's the response of my female colleagues, this is my response to you. And I actually, I was mad. I was mean. I, I, I mean, I'd had it, Lori. I said, I didn't say, I, see, I said, you fix this or I'll own a piece of this campus before the end of the semester. And she wrote me back an email 15 minutes later and said, it's taken care of. You don't have to worry about this again. And lo and behold, I never heard again, never from the child again. So, you know, this is Rebecca again, and I, I've never met Tristan, but have listened to his story a few times now, and, and at first I have to say I'm incredibly grateful to him that he was willing to share his experience with us today. And the thing that has struck me time and time again when I've listened to his story is just how unfortunate and uncommon both the response that he got um, to, when he tried to reach out for help, how, uncom how common that is, that, that people minimized, um, didn't believe what was happening, tried to talk him out of it, tried to talk him into saying that it wasn't that big a deal, and had you know, a lot of preconceived notions and ideas of what stalking really is. But then also the incredible common reactions that he felt, the, the various times that he felt anxiety. And, and so I just want to pick apart this a little bit um, and talk about how he mentioned the need to collect all of this information about what happened in his case. So collecting all those times that she had emailed that that student, the stalking offending student had called, the email, the text, and all that sort of stuff. That burden is often on the victim to do. But I, as I said before, it is essential that people do that, whether they want to go forward with any sort of report at the time. It's critical to keep that information. And I have to say, from a victim's perspective, this can be really difficult to do because sometimes what is being said, you know, as, as Tristan said in, in one part, the, the emails that the student would send are completely nasty and, you know, and abusive. And this can be really difficult 
for someone to have to suffer through, to have to read, and then to keep it and collect it and print it out. Um, and so we need to think about that because a lot of times if any of us get abusive messages, our tendency is to want to just get rid of them, right? To, to throw them away, to get them out of our, out of our, um, out of our site. But it's important that we keep all of that information. You know, um, and so that burden is really on the victim. And I will say that though, it can be very helpful as, as Tristan explained later on, he thought that that was something that eventually led the administration to, um, to understanding what was happening to him and just the, the, the breadth of the ways in which this stalker had sort of infiltrated his life and put him through all of this. So the other thing that I thought was really interesting that Tristan articulated so well is that a lot of times in stalking cases, there's kind of an ebb and a flow, that it's not all the time that the stalking behavior is, is very intensive. Um, there can be times of like a lot of behavior and then other times where it's less. And part of what can be so anxiety producing for the victim is just kind of not knowing what that person's going to do next, um, kind of when they're going to pop up. And so these cases can last a long time. I mean, Tristan has said that this one lasted for a better part of a year. Some stalking victims um, experience, you know, upwards of five to six years. And, you know, we've certainly heard from the work with victims that have been stalked by people for over 20 years. So the incredible anxiety and fear and unpredictability that stalkers have to live with um, was certainly articulated by Tristan. Just that not knowing what's going to happen next, not knowing what that student was going to do, how she might leverage, you know, things against him. And, you know, when he talked about internalizing some of that surveillance and it sounded like was possibly changing his routines, he changed his phone number a couple of times, did all these things to try and keep himself and, and his spouse safe. Um, but this stalker still infiltrated all these different parts of his life. And this is unfortunately a very, very common thing that, that stalkers will do. And that fear of just not knowing when that person's going to pop up, not knowing if that person's going to kind of, I think as Tristan said, go off the deep end. You know, we, we kind of get in this pattern of wanting to minimize that and wanting to talk ourselves out of, and, and sort of rationalize ourselves out of those fears. And what happens, I think, in a lot of stalking cases, and Michael mentioned this before, is that people, victims aren't allowed to trust their gut. I mean, think about how many times Tristan tried to reach out to people and say, this is happening and this is a problem, and, and I know that this is a problem, and was, was sort of rationalized or tried, people tried to kind of talk him out of that. And so, of course, the reactions that, that he had, that anger, that distress, that fear, the fear for his reputation, the fear for his spouse, um, those are all very common and very valid reactions that stalking victims have. And then just um, to, to, to sort of wrap some of this up, we know that people minimize what's happened. Sometimes people will actually blame the victim for, for the stalking behavior, but it is essential that we allow people to trust their gut and to tell, allow them to tell us their stories and we figure out how to assist that person. Rebecca, that was really quick for, for the wrap-up of, of Tristan's story. Um, and we do have, it looks like, around five minutes for some questions. And I know Lurie's been responding to a bunch of them as they've come in. And I'm wondering, Lurie, if you have picked out a question or two that we can um, have Rebecca answer while we're Yes. Talking. I, I have prioritized the questions based on what I think most people might find useful. One was, what are the buzzwords for law enforcement to help them take a, case, a stalking case more seriously? Oh, that is a great question. Thank you for that. Some, I wish I could say there were perfect buzzwords, but I will tell you that that documentation process can be extremely helpful. Having having um, this pattern of behavior kind of articulated in a chronological, organized fashion can be helpful. And a lot of times what will happen is that if a person can, one, maybe know their statute of their state, um, but also kind of work with or find the friendly law enforcement. Maybe it's the person who investigates family violence crimes. Maybe it's the person who, you know, who works on um, stalking cases. If, if there is, you can call up a department and find out, do you have an investigator that works on stalking cases because we are dealing with a stalking situation. 
Um, and then again, as I said, having a really clear kind of um, map of what has happened to a person can be helpful when wanting to report to law enforcement. And I should say, if I haven't mentioned this before, after this webinar, I am available for consultation on, on cases. If, um, if anyone needs anything, they can certainly reach me at my email or, or give me a call. My contact information is available. But thank you for that question. Okay, I do have one more that I'd like to ask you. Um, how do you document text messages when the perpetrator is using different phones? That's a great question. That is very common also in stalking cases. And so you want to make sure that you're taking, perhaps taking a picture of the text message of both whatever number it's coming in from um, and the content of the message. A lot of times the phone companies aren't keeping a rec the actual content of the message. They might have a log of how many times you received a text message from a certain number, um, but are not always keeping the actual content. So you want to take a picture or print out, you know, sync it with your computer or something and print it out. Um, and kind of jotting down and keeping track of what numbers they might be coming in from. Text messages and caller ID and phone calls are easy to be spoofed, which means that it can, um, somebody could trick your caller ID essentially and show a different number than what they might actually be calling from. And you can learn more about that from the technology resources that we have. And again, if you have specific questions about a case, I'm, I'm happy to chat with, with people individually. Okay. Um, I, I think we will need to um, forward the other questions to you afterwards, Rebecca. Um, so Michael, would you like to wrap up? I sure would. Thank you. Um, I really appreciate everybody being here today. And Rebecca, I definitely appreciate your time and effort and all of your good, good, smart thoughts that you've shared with everybody. Um, a couple of reminders are that um, the PowerPoints will be emailed out tomorrow around this time of the day. And the recording of this webinar will also be included in that follow-up email. And we really value your, your feedback and your opinions. When the webinar closes, you'll have a very brief survey and we'd really love to hear your your thoughts and your responses and then there's another option in that survey to ask questions so we encourage you to pose more questions if you didn't ask them already and we will try to respond to the questions that you have posed in today's live session I wanted you to know too that um, next month June we are not going to do a trans 101 which was originally scheduled for June 12th and instead, we encourage you to enjoy the summer and maybe look at the, one of the pre-recorded webinars for 101 issues on our website. Or keep an eye out for our training schedule. So again, thank you, Rebecca, for being here and for sharing so much today. And thank you all for being here and listening and, and participating in improving the lives of trans survivors. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.